Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Fairness fatigue. Yes, in my backyard. Collapsing public housing. Atlantic Yards in Columbia University. The state of black New York. Mike Bloomberg. Will he ever get it? And the bad words. Nigga, bitch, hoe. Oh. These are but a smattering of the topics confronted by Daily News columnist and editorial board member Errol Lewis. Before going to the news in 2004, Errol was the associate editor of the New York Sun. He's also a frequent guest on radio and television, both locally and nationally. He has been cited by New York Magazine as one of 10 New Yorkers, quote, making a difference. Welcome, Errol. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I've read the last six months of Errol Lewis's columns, and it's like law and order. You really get a sort of sense of the person and the themes that you're interested in. And the one that struck me and, and, and sort of brought out your, your rage, if you will, your outrage anyway, is the bad words. I mean, you've written several columns about this, and most recently on September 9th about Eddie Griffin. Talk about... What's, what you see is going on, its impacts, and what can be done about it. There, there is and has been for a long time a civil war going on within black America. You know, and and what, it, what it's about is on one side you have the forces who are trying to hold together families and communities, the forces of decency, mm -hmm. basically. They're trying to teach kids to respect themselves, to have fulfilling lives, to, uh, to advance in the workplace and, and in culture generally. And on the other side, you have some very cynical operators who are backed by Madison Avenue and Hollywood and, and the, the record industry. And uh, they, they, they- Black operators. Black and white. And, and who they, are funded by black yes, and white. And they do something that's been popular in America for over 100 years. Basically, it's a, a modern version of the minstrel show, where you basically denigrate and, and uh, lampoon and make fun of black folk. And it has real world effects. I mean, there's this myth that, oh, it, they're just telling stories, or oh, it's just a record, oh, it's just a commercial. But the reality is, you know, and I work with words for a living, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, words mean something. Images mean something. They, they get inside people's heads. They change the culture. They, they make a difference. And the reality is, if we're going to have a free speech debate, one side has been dominating it. But increasingly, those of us who are in favor of some decency and some dignity and some self-respect are fighting back and using our free speech. And it's been, it's been quite a battle. Talk about the Eddie Griffin situation, which is sort of a, a if not a sister soldier moment, a moment. It's a moment. In fact, I would put it uh, um, right up there with the Don Imus moment, where uh, it's clear that excesses have led to a backlash. So Eddie Griffin goes before Go ahead. Uh, the, this annual shindig thrown by Black Enterprise down at some big uh, resort in Miami. And um, he gets up and he starts doing his routine full of vulgar stuff, full of the N-word. And the whole point, in fact, was, well, why are leaders telling us not to use the N-word? All of a sudden, the mic goes dead. Out comes Earl Graves with the mutton chops, you know. Talk, right. You want to talk about old school. This right. guy's right. hairstyle is from the 18th century. And he comes yeah, out and, and he comes out like the, the executionist from the Apollo Theater. Oh, right. And says, this, this set is over. Wow. You're done. And he, he apparently wanders back out and, um, you know, uh, gets, Earl Graves gets a standing ovation. Eddie Griffin comes out later and sort of, you know, throws the F word at the whole crowd and then vanishes off into basically into the midst of history. Wow. Um, and these guys, I mean, all of them. I mean, and I'm talking about the rappers and the comedians and the... the, the I, I mean, I, they're, they're, they are getting a comeuppance. They are getting an education. Is that happening or is this it's, just a no. sideshow, a little blip? When yeah. Don Imus... Because the bucks are going to be made. When Don Imus uh, lost $50 million worth of, 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 of promotional dollars from top corporations because of that one stupid little slip that capped a level of disgust that was uh, been building nationwide... Right. Um, I think that said to every little rapper and hip hop guy and, and, and radio announcer who likes to dabble in that stuff, that there, there isn't going to be much more money in it. In fact, I started getting calls, interestingly enough, from people who said that they wanted to, quote, come in out of the cold, so to speak, 
and, and clean up their act. And you started seeing people falling over themselves to say, we're, our records are going to be clean, we're not going to use the N-word, that sort of thing. But, I mean, if you listen to the music, if we turned on the radio now, how much real change has there been over the last oh, oh, no, five there's, years? There's absolutely, well, five years is too broad. I mean, okay, we're, we're, we're in the moment. Listen, when you, yeah, look, do it. when you look at, uh, two years ago, 50 Cent had the top-selling album in the whole right, United right. States, right? Uh, uh, in the whole world, really. And, and um, the year after, it was High School Musical. Very different. The, the sales, if you look at it, are, are tanking on, on a lot of this gangster rap. It's just not something. I mean, how many times can you hear somebody say that they're a tough guy, they're a pimp, oh, they sell drugs, they kill people? I know. Okay, we get the story. Right. You know, now, if there's no musicianship behind it, and increasingly... We, there wasn't. No, there isn't. I mean, right. they're not musicians. It was boring. Listen, I grew up playing the saxophone. You know, I was taking lessons from the time I was nine years old all the way through high school. You know, so you know, you know a little bit about it, right? Sure. When you see somebody whose only credential is they used to sell drugs, they've been busted for selling heroin, and, and they, now they're going to... they're gonna, marketed as heroes. They're marketed as, they're marketed as artists. And then, I'm an artist. Okay, and then, I'm and then sorry. Every, and then everything they, that they say is, I'm not an artist, I'm a gangster. If this doesn't work, I'll go back to selling drugs. You know, so they don't, they're not entitled to a great deal, I think, of artistic uh, uh, leeway. I'm uh, not and, disagreeing. And, and in any event, I don't believe in censorship, but I do believe in what you might call counter-speech. That you have free speech, I have free speech. And if you want to tell people that you're, you know, you're a killer and you're a pimp and you're a drug dealer, I'm going to use my forum you know, right. it, it, to say that I think killers and thieves and untrained you know, would-be musicians um, are putting out garbage and people should go for something a little bit better. Okay. And also your, your outrage at this extends to the celebrities in our society who get away with a lot because they are who they are, the white beaters and the child molesters, et cetera. There's this, this cultural sewage that you referred to uh, more than once in your column. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, there's, there's this, I call them the four big lies that are perpetrated by Hollywood, Madison Avenue, and, and, and the, the worst parts of the culture. And they are that you can have sex without responsibility, that uh, life is basically a big game, that you don't have to work hard and that those of us who do work hard are a bunch of chumps you know and and kids are absorbing that you know that's and, and, i've and seen it when it's thrown at you hour after hour day after day that's a lot to ask a 10 year old to resist and of course the response you know in a lot of quarters is well that's the parents job okay well the parents could use some help sure and i see myself as trying to bolster the efforts of parents and i constantly in the column you've seen I'm pointing out, it's like, look, this is a learning moment. When, right. Lil, when Lil Kim goes to prison for a year because she wanted to live out this gangster lifestyle where they actually, you know, were, were firing rounds and shot two people on the streets of New York, right. and she wants to, you know, lie to a jury about what she saw and what she did, and she goes to prison for it, she's not a hero, you know, and that, that's really all I wrote. I say, and, I, and I said She's people, not a hero in our eyes, but in the people who immerse, the young people immersed in the culture, is she a hero? Well, you know, Does she... Does it give a prop? She, she might be, but I'll tell you, you know, street cred, but I just added some more facts to it, such as that her record sales tanked. Okay. I mean, she, you know... Empirical she, evidence. Yeah, well, exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, I wrote one of my favorite columns was about a, a kid named G-Dep, who, you know, was in this semi-famous video where they did the Harlem Shake. Right. And the kid, it was, it, he went through something that black musicians and entertainers and athletes have gone through for generations. He basically got ripped off. He signed a $350,000 contract with P. Diddy to do seven albums. Well, you know, it takes two years to do an album. Mm -hmm. So he basically signed a 10-year contract for $350,000. He's a $35,000 working stiff. He's doing slightly worse than if he was that mythological manager at a McDonald's. You okay. Know? And, um, and I, when I interviewed him, he'd just gotten out of Rikers Island. He couldn't make $750 bail. Mm -hmm. He got into some, some foolishness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I laid out chapter and verse and all of the numbers, and I said specifically, teachers, guidance counselors, parents, preachers, show this to the kids. Tell them that what they think they see on the video, you know, because you can still turn sure. on the TV and sure. see G-Dep sure. doing the Harlem sure. Shake and sure. the bling and the cars and everything. It's all gone. And uh, and you are seeing this community movement, this grassroots movement happening in Brooklyn in black communities? I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there are marches. There are anti-violence marches that are going on. There's at least half a dozen that have never been reported. And I'm, I'm sort of waiting to sort of compile them all and uh -huh. write, write a nice story sure. about it. But there are people who are just, you know, without any, you know, it's, it's, it's the right kind of movement because it's not highly structured, not organized, mm -hmm. not charismatic. Right. They're just 
fed up individuals who are just taking matters into their own hands and going out and fighting the good fight. What about uh, slightly moving in, in a different direction? What about the role of the police and the NYPD in those communities that will allow those individuals not only to to protest against the cultural garbage, but the, the thugs, the hoods, the dope dealers, etc. You wrote a very touching piece on the Tompkins houses yeah. that indicate that suggest what's going on. Well, the, 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 this cultural civil war I'm telling you about is actually a shooting war. You know that it, it's not just about words that are said on the radio. It's about people internalizing those destructive attitudes mm -hmm. and using, you know, and one of those destructive attitudes is that the way to get ahead in this world is by force and fraud. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a, a gang in the case of the Tompkins houses in Bedford-Stuyvesant that had basically taken it over to the point where they wrote in foot-high letters all over the place, welcome to death row. It gave, it gave me goosebumps. I said, how did this happen? And it, it, the residents said it had been there for a year. Why, you know? why is it there? Why well, aren't the forces of authority, NYCHA, the NYPD, what is it? Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's an uncomfortable sort of um, two sides to the public safety success of New York. Over and over you hear that the overall statistics are coming down to 40-year lows and so forth. Dramatic. Well, first of all, you know as, as a professor, you throw out all the statistics except homicide because you can fudge everything right, e except right, the dead body. Right, so right. just looking at homicide, Brooklyn North is the only area in the city, the 10 precincts of Brooklyn North, where homicides are going up. And they're going up dramatically over the last couple of years. Why? And not just that, but of those 10 precincts, it's really four precincts What's that are continuous. The seven, seven? It's the 7-9, um, well, it's really the 8-1, the 7-3, the 7-5, um, and probably the 7-9. So you're talking about Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, Okay, no, East I've been New in York. those precincts. And, um, Brownsville, yeah. So, so my dad used to run the 73rd precinct actually really? a long time ago. Yeah, um, and and what's going on there is, and, and if you you break it down even within that, it's concentrated around the housing developments. Right. It's, it's young kids. What some of the older gangsters are telling me is that um, these kids are not even fighting over money. It's over. It's over ego. It's over turf. Maybe over a girl once in a while. And, and it's, it's this extremely lethal kind of situation out there. So it doesn't matter what the stakes are. It's almost that it happens. Well, you know, community policing and the, the, the broken windows model is really meant to apply to career criminals. Someone right. who sort of sizes up the situation right. and says, a let me go do something A rational else. actor, if the you The rational know. crook, right. right. This is something different. You right. Know, this, you know, because they... they it's more pernicious. Well, exactly. Much harder to control. Right. You, they just bumped up the penalties. If you are caught now with an unlicensed or illegal firearm, you go to th prison for three and a half years now, mandatory. It's very hard to plead that down at this point. Kids don't know that, or they don't care. You know, it's, it's, it's not a rational we, calculation when you're going to... We hope it's that they don't know, because if they don't care, we're in trouble. Well, you know, we've got we're a little bit trouble. of both. We're, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. We are in trouble. We are in trouble. Okay, let's move. Totally different topic. Atlantic Yards, Columbia... Walmart. Your, your positions on these issues probably don't make you very popular with the, some of your neighbors? No, on the contrary. Well, some of the neighbors. Yeah, that's true. Some of the neighbors. Talk about um, your stand, pros, cons. Well, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of development. And you say it's a different topic, but to me it's the same topic. No, you know, uh, because, absolutely. Because Go the, ahead. The, thing, the, the, the two things that are going on with development that are, uh, to me, of paramount importance is the possibility of jobs, the possibility of, of, uh, of, of middle-income housing is a sort of a side mm -hmm. uh, benefit. But m more importantly than that, especially in the Atlantic Yards project, there's been a retail revolution. There are big stores, discount stores. Target is one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chuck E. Cheese's, you know. Uh, when you finally got them built in Brooklyn, they became the top grossing in the entire United States mm -hmm. for those chains. Mm -hmm. um, you... And more importantly, it's, it's demand. And more importantly, it saved people. People who need to save money, money. can save three hundred, four hundred dollars a year. And and if there's a if there was a tax, it's basically like a tax cut. If you gave a tax cut to somebody of four hundred dollars, you know, people start throwing confetti and they're praising it to the skies. You know what it's like to buy baby formula. If you can pay, right. you know, I mean, you you know, you feed the kid every day. Yep. Next day he wants to eat again. Yep. If you can save somebody five or six or ten dollars every week. For a whole year, you have done a really important Absolutely. thing. Absolutely, and it's going to be more. Yeah. Now, you wrote in a p uh, column on March 29th that the union leaders and the Pauls have a moral obligation to help New, New York, low-income New Yorkers get the goods that they 
denied them by by rejecting Walmart. No, absolutely, absolutely. There's been this long fight. I mean, I get the emails all the time. They you want to they want to fight Walmart, oh. and I all my union pals. They know exactly where they're coming from. But you know what? If I'm in Long Island or I'm visiting my wife's family in Jacksonville, Florida, we go to Walmart. You know because. I can't afford the damn diapers, you know. And I, I, Wait, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I bought diapers within the last two weeks at Walmart. Please, of course you did. Please, you can buy please. like and a fishing rod. So I'm you in know, trouble. Yeah. So, I'm so, in trouble. I mean, I just go ahead and do it, and I tell everybody else, look, you don't have the right to lock people, working people, poor people, mm-hmm. to lock them in this situation where suburbanites or you know New Yorkers who can get in a car and go someplace get cheaper prices than the folks who are trapped at the local bodega or the little supermarket. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Atlantic Yards. Atlantic Yards, I think, is a, a, a great example of, of um, the people's voice not really being heard. You know, there's been this myth that the community is up in arms about this. But right. the reality is... And there's a race element to this as well. Oh, no, there was right from the beginning. Right. I mean, the, the reality is that the guy who is leading the opposition, Daniel Goldstein, has filed this lawsuit and so forth, by his own admission, he moved into the area three months before the project was announced. So he's been there for 90 days. Doesn't have to work. He's a rich guy, you know. Um, and he is now saying that the community is against this. Now, I'm living in a house my dad bought 50 years ago. You know, I've got all kinds of cousins and relatives, my wife, my kid, everybody. Mm. We're, you know, we're grounded here. We're, we, you know, we've staked everything here. You're in Brooklyn. Yeah. And I look at the project, and I come to a different conclusion. There's no reason to, that it had to be as acrimonious that it has, as it has become. But the reality is most of the people that I know, the real community leaders, Bertha Lewis from Acorn, mm-hmm. Freddie Hamilton, anti-violence activist, mm-hmm. um, all kinds of folks, the people who run the precinct council, they, they looked at it and they said, yes, we want this. There's thousands of, of uh, homes being built. Mm-hmm. There's thousands of jobs that will be created. And that open scar of a rail yard that was probably there since we were both, you know, I mean, oh, as long as I can remember. Oh, since, easy. Easily since the Eisenhower administration, probably a little bit before. And it will finally be turned into something meaningful. And so to me, what should have happened was a negotiation over what benefits can we get? Do we want to scale it down? But didn't Do that happen in part? It did. I mean, there was a community benefits agreement. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what happened really was the developer hired a lot of political talent. Right. Um, yeah, right. Forest City, right. Yeah, and um, former Consumer Affairs Commissioner. Everyone thinks of him as simply a developer, but he really very consciously brought about part of this retail revolution I mentioned before. Uh, he hired a lot of political talent. He went around and talked to the people mm-hmm. he needed to talk yep. to. The yep. preachers with real, with real constituents, the, uh, the community leaders with very real constituents. Very savvy political strategy. Very savvy. And, operation. and he put together this community benefits agreement. Now, you can quibble with... Whether or not it's good, could it be better, could you add or subtract from it? But to say that there was no consultation with the community is simply false. You know, so now w- where we are is this really polarized situation. Because I think when they talk about the Manhattanization of Brooklyn, right. a lot of times people are referring to brick and mortar and big buildings. In this case, I'd say the Manhattanization happened when people brought these really vicious kind of uh, wounding statements and strategies, you know, because look, I've been in a lot of fights in Brooklyn, but at the end of it, you know, I've become semi-friendly with most of the people, right. you know, um, that hasn't happened in this case, you know, and, and it's, what is it's it really about unfortunate. the issue that has uh, allowed these cleavages to be maintained? My, in my opinion, it's, just vitriol it, and now anger and hatred. You know, I think it's people who were newcomers, who came and made statements and comments, disparaging personal cutting remarks, challenging people's integrity. Okay. That, um, Big mistake. Yeah, huge mistake. I mean, I, I got drawn so deeply into this, not because of anything people said to me. I get, you know, I mean, people, I, got a, I got a powerful newspaper in the first right, amendment. Right, and, and people say bad things about you all the time. It happens all the time. And you don't care. You've been getting hate mail for years. It's right, part of the job. Right, right. But when you start attacking people that I know for a fact went out and faced down drug dealers, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in the bad old days when there was no help, there was no fanfare, there was no reward, there mm-hmm. was no pay, there was no benefit whatsoever. When these people are attacked as somehow having sold out or somehow not trustworthy, the, the opponents made the hugest mistake by doing that over and over and over again. What did they want? I mean, tactically and strategically, they, they, they seem to have overplayed the hand. Yeah, oh, not absolutely. You described it. Yeah. What were their obje- What are were and are their objections? The objectives continuously shifted. So literally, you, you can't really put okay. your finger on it. But I think probably the most legitimate 
concern were, were some of the environmental impacts and so forth. But they made it impossible to get to those issues because there was such intense polarization over whether or not the project should happen in the first place. The perfect being the enemy of the good? Absolutely, absolutely. And, they're, they're, and, it, and it may be maybe an incorrect definition of the perfect. On well, I'll tell you what, the, 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 the project is going to be, I wrote this, is going to be bigger than it would have been had they not uh, acted like such idiots. The so project is the law of unintended be, consequences is operating right there yeah. in your face, and and I mean, and I look, I put it in the newspaper and said to them, it's like, listen, people are going to just stand firm and hold ranks behind this project, right? You know, rather than risk seeing it go away, right? And, and uh, that's well, where we are. Or we'll have some changes or rational modifications. Yeah, well, it's, it's a lesson to anybody, you know, doing community politics or any other kind. You have to be very careful before you make it an all or nothing proposition, right? Because right. you can because easily some, end up with nothing. with nothing. Yeah. What about Colombia? Um, uh, not, you know, not, yeah, not no, quite different. As, yeah, not quite as polarized. No, not quite. Um, but 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 Dave Dinkins gets booed in a public forum. Same same phenomenon. Same phenomenon. When they when they uh, go after Bill Lynch, um, Dinkins' former chief of staff, they go after uh, David Dinkins. Guys like me and I look. I did used to live there. I used to live in the Manhattanville projects, so I actually am familiar with the area. And it, frankly, it looks a lot like it did the day we moved out in 1969. That's, this is not good. Not, not so good, or need, in need of development. But right. when, you, when you boo somebody who's done more for Harlem than almost anybody you could name in the last 50 years, David Dinkins, um, um, you know, Bill Lynch, who went and did the takeover of Sydenham Hospital, mm -hmm. which, you know, your I older remember. viewers will remember. I right? remember. I mean, people put a lot out there. Both of these guys, they've got health issues. They've done, I mean, they brought along so many people. They've done so much for this community to simply boo them because in their judgment, the inevitable development that's going to come to West Harlem would best be led by Columbia University. The um, money, the money is going to make over that neighborhood no matter what. Yes, I mean, look. And Columbia, it, in your argument, would be the the best of the the options out there, or I mean, the least it, of what we say. It compared, compare that to say Donald Trump. You know, I mean, they're going to put research facilities no. there. I mean, you right. know, I mean, no, 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 I you know, and, and I work for a university. I'm, <laughs> I'm sympathetic to universities. And you know that there are ways to pressure them, that there's that they have a kind of a cultural stock. Absolutely. And a reputation. Absolutely. That becomes a, a, a crucial ingredient of the whole negotiation. Absolutely. So and there's an accountability there. And there ought to be. Let's go to Brooklyn, just as a borough. OK, simple question. Which is more corrupt, Brooklyn or New Jersey? <laughs> um. Frankly, you know what? In pure numerical terms, I think you'd have to give it to New Jersey. I Just think, because it's bigger and well, got big more population. Well, you know, actually, um, I, that's not even the criteria I would okay, use. Okay, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The number of indicted and convicted corrupt officials per population, I think literally New well, Jersey that, would that, come Well, that, that, that may be a factor of <laughs> the law enforcement and investigatory rather than the situation. Well, I'll tell talk you. About, talk about what you call the hucksters and the incompetence. In, in political Brooklyn. There, I mean, there's there's a ton of them, and there's always more, you know. So so the you know a guy who I actually knew for for about 20 years, Clarence Norman, is sitting in prison today, you know. And and a lot of us saw it coming. I knew a lot of the people who worked with him. I mean, um, you know, he covered part of Crown Heights. I lived in the other part mm -hmm. of Crown Heights, but I used to carry petitions for the guy, you know. I mean, I used to work in the volunteer in the Brooklyn political organization before and while he ran it. And, and for what reason? Why was I involved in politics? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, you 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 land on the ground at 22, 23 years old. What are your and options? You didn't join the reformers. You went worked for Clarence. Clarence Norman? was a reformer. This is the, oh, this okay. is the thing. Oh, some, okay. There was something so, when I look the, when I my one the of perversion my, of the reformers. One of my first stories coming out of college was on this thing called the Coalition for Community Empowerment, and it was Al Van and right. it was uh, right. Major Owens, and it was Clarence Norman. And, and it was a two bunch or of these three guys. of them went to jail. Well, they they th Roger Green had his own problems. Right. They they threw out a bunch of the the old guard. I, I they, remember. They did and valiant they battle. Right. They did valiant battle with uh, uh, Meet Esposito's right. uh, machine. The Jeff Club. And they they won seats. They did what they were supposed to do. They brought a new generation, including me, frankly. Mm -hmm into politics. Right. Now, somewhere along the line, the whole thing went really sour, and Clarence in particular um, really got away from his reform roots, I guess is the but nicest lot, way you could put it. A lot of the elected officials in Brooklyn, and, and, and I'm, I'm maybe biasly thinking of a lot of the black and Hispanic leadership, is bad, incompetent, come on. Well, look, there's, there's a generational shift that is only yeah. now starting to play. Now, is, there, is, is, is what I'm beginning to see, is there this next generation, these 20 and 30 and early 40s, moving in and challenging? Sure. 
I'm sure. I mean, uh, challenge, yeah, challenge. I mean, the best example, Hakeem Jeffries ran against right. Roger Green three right. times. Right, right. Um, finally won when Roger walked away from it. Right. You really cannot dislodge incumbents in Brooklyn or any place No, they have to be indicted or die. Something like that, uh, or resign. And, and, and um, uh, Hakeem is a lawyer. You know, if you look, if you compare the previous generation, you had mostly social workers, folks who ran daycare centers. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they come from that orientation. Right, right. Um, not that familiar, frankly, in a hands-on way with the, the workings of the private market. No, you know, not On at the all. other hand, now you have Hakeem Jeffries, a corporate right. lawyer. That's He's a true. big shot at Viacom. So you see, you see some kind of legitimate, emergent, potentially dominant group? Well, yeah. I mean, okay. Yvette Clark is the new congresswoman, and Hakeem Jeffries is there. Eric Adams, another young leader. Okay. Um, um, Kareem Kamara, a okay. young guy who I met in politics 10 years ago, who's now the assemblyman. He took over after Clarence okay. Norman. The last, the, you know, we, we've got a, a minute. Mm -hmm. One of the, the pieces that struck me was your advice to Cory Booker, the mayor of Newark, to follow tough guy Frank Rizzo in Philadelphia, to quote unquote, kick ass and take names. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, it's, it, it, it's real serious. I mean, and this is in Brooklyn, too, I would presume that you need to kick. It needs to happen. It needs to happen. And it did happen under Giuliani. I mean, he might have been a better example, but you, 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 it's not enough to fight crime. You have to let the criminals know that you're fighting them and that you intend to win. When Cory Booker won before he was sworn in, the head of the Bloods in Newark said he was going to assassinate right. him. Now, if that happened to Rudy Giuliani, can you imagine what would have happened to that gang? Yeah. And Corey looked the other way, and now you've got a crime problem spinning out of control. So I, I, it was a piece of political advice straight out of Machiavelli, which is, you know, you have to not just do, you also have to seem tough. Yeah, but does, doesn't that raise the possibility of abuse, you know, kick ass? I mean, you know, yes. is that the advice we want to give to the BD and other members of the community? I remember sitting, because my dad was a cop at the time, um, sitting and listening to a lecture to the command staff of the NYPD, everybody captain and above, mm -hmm. by uh, George Kelling and James Q. Wilson, right. the authors of... Broken uh, Windows. Yeah. And, but part of it was, they told them, they said, you have to go out there and kick ass, that you're not social workers, you're the NYPD. And it created a kind of a morale and a theory and a sort of a, a spirit that even the, even the crooks understood. And whatever it is they're doing in Newark, the crooks aren't reading the memos. They're not looking at the statistics right. on shootings coming down right. or whatever. They're, they're Homicides are out of control. They're, they're, being, being they're being thugs. And if you can threaten to assassinate the mayor and have that taken seriously with no overt reprisal, you have handed over to, to, to the criminal element an incredible propaganda victory that they didn't deserve and, and should not have. Errol Lewis, continue kicking ass. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.